When I came out with my first rap jam, I had no idea that the record would slam. It did real good without radio play. Maybe at night, but no airplay in the day. Give me that brother shit, man. Not today, all right? on either side of the ocean are happiest when we blacks are fighting each other. It keeps our eyes distracted from their long, greedy hands. Look, I wouldn't give a Give? Damn. You? Give? I'm not asking you to give. I'm asking you to help yourself. You symbolize those who fail to understand that revolution must be a constant condition for us. You represent the fact that there are still Africans and black Americans who yet need more dragging, more beating, more kicking until they realize that we are not free, that we are still slaves. You, monsieur, you are not free because you are the worst kind of slave. Bonjour. I'm talking about the world Christopher Columbus did not discover. But I'm talking about what Christopher Columbus set in motion because he set in motion in his period set in motion an act of criminality that influences our very life today. It laid the basis for Western racism. It laid the basis for misconceptions about people. It laid the basis for extensive use of organized religion as a rationale for the enslavement of people. It's a reoccurring event in history and it told us as if nothing has told us before that history is never old everything that ever happens continues to happen what we are dealing with now is more than the second rise of Europe we're dealing with the rise of a concept that has taken hold of the mind of most of the world. And people throughout the world are now fighting to get away from that concept. And a whole lot of people are prisoners to that concept. We're dealing with the reason certain things looked as though they were going to succeed and did not succeed. 
We're actually dealing with the, the reason why the African independence explosion did not culminate in independence, why the civil rights movement did not culminate in any civil rights, and why the Caribbean Federation did not culminate in any independence from Caribbean states. Independence in name only, flag independence, but actual economic independence, they are more dependent now than they were at the height of colonialism. It, it, it set in motion the exposure of the fact that once you are oppressed and once certain information is kept from you, you begin to experience some confusion about what independence consists of. Now, let's look at the world before Columbus, then let's pick up Columbus's world and look at his impact on the Americas and look at the world he did not discover but what he actually did, and he should be credited for this, he set in motion the exploitation of two continents for European domination. He never set foot on North America or South America. He set in motion an attitude that is still with us a concept called divine white right and something else called manifest destiny. The assumption because Europeans had the ships and the basic technology, they had the right to go into other people's country, exploit their mineral resources, to take and rape their women at will, and they did all of this in the name of a God that they said was merciful and kind. All of them using Western Orient religions, and that includes the Arabs, made their God ungodly. Now, the role of religions in the domination and the destruction of African civilization, all of them, and there are no exception, Islam being as ruthless as all the rest of them, the role of religions in this matter is so shameful, no matter how you look at it, the picture is negative, because all of them did more harm than good. Now let's look at the world, 1400 to 1600, before we come to what is called the new world that was not new at all. During the Crusades, the Europeans had exploited each other to the point where Europe was about to explode within itself. The Catholic Church, in its need for funds to build these massive cathedrals and to support parasitical priests, had begun to fleece the people to the point where they began to have some serious questions about the role of the church. The church, it is desired to get still more money from the people, created something called pregatory. Now, when you died, you didn't go directly to heaven. You went to pregatory, and people had to pray you from pregatory into heaven. <coughs> And the more money you gave the priest, the harder, the quicker he prayed 
to get grandma and uncle from purgatory into heaven. It was a religious con game play, played on the people of Europe. They were beginning to discover this con game to the point, out of anger, Europe was about to explode within itself. Then a fortunate incident would happen, all be beatnik hermit Peter came across Europe saying that the infidel Arabs were barring Europeans from visiting the holy places and observing the holy grail and the places of the crucifixion. Now, Michael Bradley, in a still-to-be-published book, have proven that there was no Holy Grail in the first place. It wasn't lost in the second place. <laughs> and it wasn't what they thought it was in the third place. Now, the Pope saw a reason he could use to cut down on all of this anger against the church. The propaganda swept through Europe that they had to move across Europe in a crusade to rescue this mythological holy grail that wasn't lost in the first place. Now they started to march moving across Europe to the rescue. But in the movement across Europe, they forgot the pent up anger against the church. And this gave the church a lease on life that would last until the rise of Martin Luther, who would challenge them again and lay the basis for Protestantism. Now, there were many crusades, many reasons for people going on crusades, none of which had anything to do with religion or God. Now, the way the story is presented to you in school, you think it has something to do with holiness. It has something to do with European power and Europe rising from the Middle Ages are the dark ages, Europe's search for something outside of Europe to eat, European emotionalism venting itself on people outside of Europe, Europe trying to find a scapegoat for its own anger, Europe trying to defect the fact of its own enslavement of other Europeans. Now they would call it feudalism, but it was enslavement. European enslavement of other Europeans. Now, while the Crusades won the battles in the movie, Cecil B. the Mills gave them victory, in many cases, they got hell beaten out of it. <laughs> now, because these well-dressed lords took with them common ordinary people to do their work in their laundry, these common ordinary people saw these lords with their tails being beaten on their knees begging for mercy and he understood that this man who owned the land and controlled his life was less than God. In the meantime, back in Europe, the young laws had given up a privilege that the old laws were hanging on to, the privilege of first night. If you lived on his land and you married, he had the privilege of spending the first night with your wife. <laughs> The young laws had conceded that the poor critter 
should at least have that privilege. And so now, when the old laws came back into Europe, there was a semblance of human recognition for the slave, or the plain white slave, on the plantation. This semblance of human recognition would lead to more demand, lead to a fight against child labor, lead to what it didn't lead to the banishment of prostitution. It would lead to workhouses and places where they could be at least put people out of sight. Europe had lost one-third of its population through famine and plagues. Now, on the eve of 1400 A.D., this is the site you see in Europe, far less in creature comfort than anything in Africa and in Asia. Engaged in Europe, in tribal warfare that they are engaged in right now. Only in Europe, you don't call it tribal warfare. You will not deal with the fact that not only what is happening in Russia is in part, it, tribal warfare is part of race war. You forgot the millions of Asians who went into Russia, went into, went into Europe and didn't go home. Asian men who came without women and didn't go home to satisfy that biological necessity. Indeed, if it is a necessity all the time, well, that's another lecture, but I think we've overdone, I think we've overdone that assumption. I think what is a biological pleasure is not always a biological necessity. Let's at least concede that much. Well, anyway, these Europeans intermingle with these Asians to create a European ethnic entity that's still in Europe. But Europe was still hungry. While it was awakening, it began to pay some attention to the new light in Europe. And the only light in Europe was in the Mediterranean area, then dominated by Africans, Arabs, and Berbers. The Africans were totally in control of Spain, parts of France, and Portugal, where the African had left 1240 A.D., but in, 12, in 1415 A.D., the Portuguese got up enough nerve to attack a small place on the coast of Africa, a place called Sertra. Now, as battles go, it wasn't much of a battle, and as places go, it wasn't much of a place. I visited the place, and some said it's about the size of Central Park, and I walked all over it. It's not as big as Central Park. <laughs> but the Battle of Sertra was a turning point because after 7-11, when an African general, Jabaral Tarak, uh, Tarak Benazad, led an army into Spain, Spain had been under the domination of Africans, Berbers, and Arabs. And Europe had lived in fear of what they referred to as the infidel Arabs in the Mediterranean, being blocked from the trade in the Mediterranean Europe cringed, and it is this African Berber and this Arab that drove the European into the so-called Middle Ages by destroying the markets in the Mediterranean. With the Battle of Sertra, the European had asserted himself and began to claim excess 
to the Mediterranean. All right. 14... 55 arguments between the Africans and the Arabs over puritanical approaches to women had weakened the African Arab hold on Spain and the Mediterranean. They also had puritanical religious arguments because when the African joins a religion he is a Puritan within that religion. Other people join a religion and use it for their best interests. Right. But when the African join it, he, 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 he takes it in his purest form. I have said before, we will out Pope the Pope and we will out Muhammad Muhammad. <laughs> we are the true believers. Yes. Amen. We are the only people naive enough to believe in Christianity and democracy. Yes. Other people know it's not going to work. <laughs> Don't play around with it. Know full well it's not going to work. All right. Now, Spain and Portugal would now approach the Pope. And the Pope would say to them, You two good Catholic nations, stop fighting among yourselves. You're both authorized to reduce the servitude. All infidel people. You should read um, Eric Williams' Capitalism and Slavery. A lot of people think it's an old chestnut. Why must I read that old book? That old book written over 40 years ago has some of the most concise information on how and why the slave trade came of any book that's so far been written. Brian David Bryan, a scholar at Cornell University, wrote a book called Slave and Western Civilization, three times larger, and said less. All right. <clears throat> My point here is that there is a forgotten character had not been taken into consideration. I'm still on my way to Christopher Columbus. <laughs> Prince Henry, the navigator. Prince Henry got a catch of maps, mostly made by Jewish gold dealers who have been dealing with gold in the western Sudan and in the coast of West Africa, the Western Sudan are the nations in inner West Africa as against the coastal nations of West Africa. Europe is beginning to see the shape of certain parts of Africa. They're no longer guessing on all of it. Now, with these maps, Prince Henry <laughs> began to open up the school for chart making and map making to let the European know something about the other parts of the world. I recently appraised a book they called Prince Henry, The Starter of the Slave Trade, which is inaccurate. But he did set European maritime skill in motion using the maritime information the Africans and the Arabs had preserved at the University of Salamanca in Spain, Europe now would go back to sea. It had previously forgotten longitude and latitude. In other words, if they put a ship out to sea, they wouldn't know which way to turn it. Didn't know east from west. That challenge from Africa, from Mediterranean Africa, that challenge of the Moors, that challenge of the Arabs, had driven Europe into the Middle Ages and had dulled the senses of Europe to the fact that they lived now in fear. Prince Henry, while called the navigator, didn't navigate 
anything and there is no evidence that he ever went to see. The main thing Prince Henry did is to introduce Europe to maritime information and the European in turn used the maritime information coming out of China, then the leading maritime nation of the world, to go out to sea again and to get rid of some of his old wise tales about the sea and that if you go so far the sea drops off and that the land was, that the, the, the world was round or flat. But the European had begun to make up his mind all the hunger, all the famine. Now that he's got ships, he's got guns, he didn't care what shape the world was in, round or flat, I want it all. And round or flat, he's going to take it all. And you keep approaching someone, thinking somebody out of their goodness going to give up something they took from you. They took it from you, you got to take it back. This is what makes me nervous about that South African thing. We keep some of one man, one vote. You got one man, one vote in the United States, you ain't got no democracy. You got one man, one vote, you still got homeless people. You got one man, one vote, you still ain't got no job. So what one man, one vote gonna get you? You talk about multiracialism, call for total African power. If anybody can't live under African power, then show him where the airport is, show him where the shipyard is, or show him where the graveyard is. Because you have to go. No, no argument. No argument. You got to go. I like Nelson Mandela, but he makes me nervous. He have not called for the return of the land. No land, no nation. Okay, now back to the groove of the, of the talk. <laughs> the most important thing is that a little known sailor, Christopher Colon, Christopher Columbus, attended Prince Hadley, one of Prince Henry's school of chart making. And there where he learned the basis of maritime skill. Now, we have no evidence that he had or ever had any command. Now this gets us into a mystery about Columbus. Michael Bradley in a new work called the Columbus Conspiracy found so much dirt under the name Columbus, he maintains that there were two Columbuses. No one man could have been capable of that much dirt, including seven illegitimate children. Because when he spaced where the children were born and the different women, he couldn't have moved that fast from one to the other. If he side one over here, he couldn't have gotten over here fast enough to bring that one into work. All right. Now, we have to deal with another date neglected in history. 1482. Ships land off the coast of what is now Ghana, later the Gold Coast, earlier the Gold Coast, they insist now on building permanent fortifications 
Portuguese ships had been coming along that coast since 1438. They would take a few slaves out of the country. 1442. The Portuguese king, seeing these slaves so well dressed and seeing them bringing presents from home, gave them presents and sent them home. The idea of enslavement had not reached his mind. The Portuguese enslavers thought the king was crazy, had his head shaved and sent him to a monastery, got another king who could think better about the trade. Now, all right. The important thing about this trip, when they forced their way into Ghana, an African king, King Asa, differed with them and told them, if we saw each other infrequently, maybe we could maintain our friendship. Too much familiarity would erode our friendship. He was beginning to see what could happen. And then in the beautiful last lines of his speech, he said, the sea is forever pushing against the land, and the land with equal obstinacy is forever pushing against the sea. He understood what could happen, but those Portuguese who couldn't sell him the Bible story forced that gun story on him, and they forced their way in and built Elmina Castle, the first of the great slave forts along the coast of Ghana. If 36 of the 42 slave fortresses are in Ghana, this tells you that Ghana was the headquarters of the slave trade. My point of mentioning this is that there's some evidence to indicate that Christopher Columbus was a part of this expedition. He says in his diary, as man and boy, I sailed up and down the Guinea coast for 23 years. What was he doing up and down the coast of West Africa for 23 years? He was in the early Portuguese slave trade. This is Christopher Columbus. Now let's go to 1492. Because in 1492, other things happened other than the alleged discovery that was not a discovery at all. Let's deal with two African events that helped to set certain things in motion. 1492, Spain was whitening up through the marriage of Queen Isabella and Ferdinand. They began now to expel the Moors, the Africans, and the Arabs. They, if they expelled the Jews, and they did, that means they did not consider the Jews white. For well, most of the Jews were Sephardic. The same descendant of these Sephardic Jews are second-class citizens in Israel right now, though they are the majority in the population. Not a single field officer in the Israeli army is a Sephardic, though they are the majority in the army. The army is dominated by whites. Same is true of the Russian army. You've got millions of Orientals in Russia. I'm showing you that whites play the white game left or right, no matter what they say they believe religiously, no matter what they say they believe politically, they play the race game. 
<laughs> you have over 30 million Muslims in Russia. Russia is declared atheist nation. Now, Christopher Columbus, in this voyage, this early voyage, was, would have set in motion. Now, the expulsion of the Africans and the Arabs from Spain would set also in motion the Inquisition. And one of the great stick-up games in history, when certain Spaniards would tell certain people, especially the grandees, the money managers of Spain, most of the Sephardic Jews, give me the money, I'll go to the gallows. <laughs> many Jews converted to Catholicism practice Catholicism by day and Judaism by night. They were called Marinos or the silent Jews. Some of their descendants still live. Some of their descendants are still permanent. The best known of their descendants, Fidel Castro. There's a good book on it published in France hadn't been an English translation of Fidel Castro and his family, tracing his family back to the Marinos. Now he would go through the motion of being Catholic even now, playing that wise game. But this expulsion would do Spain more harm than good because the grandees brought into Spain by the Africans and the Arabs were doing a pretty good job of managing Spain's money. When you expel them, Spain has never had a strong economic sense system since then. Spain had killed the goose that laid the egg. Hadn't got itself together since then. I can say across the board, Maybe except for Cuba, show me a Spanish-speaking country and I wish you would show me a sloppy, economically-run country, any place in the world. Anybody know a well-run Spanish-speaking country? Name it. Never got themselves together. Well, all right, now. Another event would happen within Africa within inner West Africa, the Western Sudan, the emperor of the Songhe Empire, Sony Ali, would be killed coming home from a minor war in the south. He's drowned when his horse got entangled. Now the great independent states in Africa begin to fall. These states are not coastal states. These are inner West African states. These states could have rescued West Africa and saved them from the slave trade. They would go on to the a hive of grandeur in the midst of the slave trade and in spite of the slave trade. Now, 1492, Christopher Lamas setting out for the new world. Now let's ask some questions. This man has had no command position. He has not even been a petty officer. How then did this obscure sailor become admiral of the ocean seas for the Spanish nation? Who is behind this? Why is it that Christopher Columbus sailed from Spain the same week the Spanish expelled the Jews? Who exactly was Christopher?
Christopher Columbus? Was he sailing out ahead? Michael Bradley and others have now located those who financed the ships. All Jewish bankers who were told, give me your money or give me your life. They were the chief translators on the boat. He was to go to Asia. Why didn't he go to Asia? Sailing up and down the Guinea coast, West Africa, he had discovered from African sailors who had already gone to the New World there was a possibility of gold in another direction. He turned his ships in another direction. He also discovered that there was a current in the sea. He'd pick it up at a certain time of year. It would push you almost straight into the West Indies. And he picked that current. That current took him there. This is why his ships were lost coming back because he came back too soon. The current reverses itself once every six months. This is why he ended up in Portugal on his way back. But once he got there, and you should read Eric Williams' documents on West Indian history. This is an, the most underrated Caribbean scholar. Most people underrate him because they didn't like the way he ran Trinidad. I don't know how he ran Trinidad. I know he's a damn good researcher, one of the finest of the Caribbean researchers. And, uh, I knew him at Howard when he was a professor of political science. And he's a brilliant human being. Big ego, too, but damn brilliant. <laughs> damn brilliant scholar. All the way, ego notwithstanding. Eric William was a brilliant researcher. Thorough. Documents on West Indian history were only one of the four volumes he had compiled. He goes through Christopher Columbus's diaries, the best analysis of Christopher Columbus's diary that I've ever seen. And when Christopher Columbus saw these indigenous Americans mistakenly called Indians approaching his ship, he says in this monologue, I wonder why they're bringing such small amounts of gold. I wonder where the mines are. They'll be easier to conquer than I thought they would be. He would write a letter to Queen Isabella, saying that from this area I can send you as many slaves as you can accommodate. He never thought of, par he never thought of partnership. In his mind, it was enslavement from the very beginning. His intentions were not good. He would kill off his own labor supply. He would kill some of the people who came to greet him. For the documentation on this, I wish someone would read Father D. Les Casas' work, The Disruption of the Indies, Father Bartholomew de Las Casas. It's a small book and you could read it in one evening or less. Father de Las Casas is called the first historian of the, of the New World. He wrote it all down. Christopher Columbus would go to him after the third voyage and after the rapid disappearance of the Indians, he would go and ask for increase in the African slave trade to save, allegedly to save the soul of the Indians. When the Pope would send commissions to various islands, sometimes not one Indian would be alive. But the African endured. 
If the African endured and the Indian perished, it had nothing to do with the fact that the Indian were braver than the African and the African braver than the Indian. It had to do with the structure of the society. The Indian had a monolithic society. The African came out of a pluralistic society. Many societies functioning side by side. The Indian came out of a monolithic society, tight weave, while they existed side by side with the other societies. They did not give the other societies the same integration or recognition. And sometimes, which relentless war on the neighboring society. But now he's rapidly disappearing. Father D. Las Casas said that from 12 to 25 million people were killed. We're talking about the Caribbean Islands alone. Not talking about South America. Although he loses to the Mexico and South America, but his main concentration is on the Caribbean Islands. Now, Christopher Columbus would go from one place to the other. He thought Cuba was Japan. <laughs> he was sent to the East Indies. He ended up in the West Indies. He told his sailors that to sign the fact that he was in the West Indies. And if he didn't sign, he wouldn't cut the tongue out. Ben Sedum had done some pretty good chapter on this in uh, they came before Columbus. Now, when we look at this man and what he has set in motion, he set in motion the increase in the African slave trade. The British had not entered the slave trade at first because the British had some difficulty with the Catholic Church. But once the British <coughs> decided to establish a church of their own, and if you're British extraction and belong to the Church of England, you have to live with the fact that here's a church whose foundation was the hot sexual passions of Henry VIII. Anybody want to prove otherwise, I hear them. Henry VIII wanted to cut, cut off one wife's head, wanted to marry another, and all these wives. He wanted justification. He wanted a church that would back him up in all his skullduggery, including his thievery, including his raid on the church treasurer. So he created the kind of church that would give him what he wanted. That was the Church of England. Throughout his career, he defended the church as so sacred. <coughs> sacred to him because let him do what he wanted to do. Now, the queen whose head he cut off was the only one that gave him a child. That child was Elizabeth I. Someone told her, the alleged virgin queen of England, we won't discuss that any further. <laughs> now, they showed her a ledger of how much money could be made in the slave trade after she had refused to go into the business. And finally, she went into the business. One of the ships was her personal property, the good ship Jesus, headed by Captain Hawkins. Britain came into the slave trade and made it a business. A dirty business, but a business. Like well-organized gangsters with territory. The British sailed up the Gambia River, took 10 miles on the east side. That's the little facsimile nation called the Gambia right now. Never a nation. They would spread their slaveholding for the west. They would push the Portuguese out of West Africa. They would push the Spaniards out. They would have a command position. The French would come into West Africa. 
after the rationale for the entry was found for them by old holy devil called Cardinal Rachelou. But to read your Catholic literature. Now, if you want to find some literature, some religious literature defending slavery, I don't know where you're going to go in as much as the, the defense of slavery on the part of the Muslim is vicious and tragic. And on the part of the Christians, it's even more so. Now, why are you going to search for a pure religion? You ain't going to find none, so let's end that conversation. Organized religion has always endorsed the enslavement of people. Now, what about the world Christopher Columbus set in motion? He set in motion Western racism. He set in motion the colonization, not only of history, but the information about history. All of the fight over curricula was set in motion because Christopher Columbus and people set in motion a concept of divine white right, a manifest destiny. The assumption that the people of Europe had rights over other people. It set in motion another bogus concept of a chosen people by God. If God chooses one people over another people, then God is a bigot. You cannot say this and say God is also love, God is kind, God is no respect of kith and kin, and say God chose me to do something. Then, why people are choosing, in as much as all chosen people chose themselves, why in the hell don't you choose yourself to be free? Why won't you make a choice and say that we are too proud to live in slums? Why don't you understand what went wrong with the world Christopher Columbus did not discover? Why can't we understand how other people rose from the bottom and recovered what belonged to them. I have no great feelings for the Japanese, but I have some admiration about how they recovered from defeat. Because they never let their mind forget who did it and how. And they knew without shouting, without holding a single mass meeting, that if you're going to throw two atomic bombs and you're at war with two different people, why throw two on me instead of one on one side and one on the other side? They threw two on you because you were not white. And they imprisoned your people because you were not white. So now, they refused to let their enemy take away from them their self-confidence and their idea of God as they conceived him to be. And if you can hold on to that, you can recover from almost anything. Now let's end by saying what we could have done to recover from the disaster of the world Christopher Columbus did not discover. During the concept of a Caribbean Federation, the first thing we could have done or should have done was to unify all of those islands and have a common defense force. Therefore, there would have been no Grenada, 
There have been no Panama invasion. There have been a common currency, a common defense force, an economic union, what one can produce, the other one could produce, a common tax structure. Put them all together, then what have you got geographically? Look at all the territory you got. Once you put them together into a common unity and a common parliament. Now you you have a local parliament. Now let me let me show you what I'm talking about now. Every state in the United States has its own House of Representatives and local representation. And yet every state in the United States has representation in Washington. So this does having a common parliament for all of the Caribbean islands does not keep them from having local things specifically to take care of local situations. But a common parliament to take care of island-wide situations. We have not dealt with a contradiction. The concept of pan-Africanism was created by three Trinidadians, George Padmore, C.L.R. James, H. Sylvester Williams. Why is it that they never could unify Trinidad or a single island? Why is it that of the three, not a single one of them ever found a long-lasting unity with a black woman? This is delicate talk now. You talk naturally, you expect it to live it. Live some of it. Why is it that no one sat down and figured out a judicial system solely for those islands? as against an imitation of a judicial system of England. You had the right to do it. You had the responsibility to do it. There was nobody, there's no law against you doing it. Why didn't you do it? It's a form of intellectual retardation that hits every people on earth who are oppressed. Now, when we come to the United States, <laughs> when we had the greatest technical opportunity, why didn't we, 25 years before independence, call attention to the fact that if you're going to have an independent state, you need people who manage mines, airports, hospitals. Why shouldn't we have quietly put people in school to learn all of those skills? And the minute Africa is free, we form a partnership with the Africans so the Africans wouldn't have to be dependent on the Europeans. Why shouldn't we think of something as elementary as that? Is any non-Japanese building Japan? Because the Japanese sent his children to the schools of the world to learn all those skills and bring them home. Anybody build his airplane? Anybody building his ships? He's doing it themselves. When you have to call your former master back to do basic things for you, you are not free. You have re-enslaved yourself or recolonized yourself. We spend too much time celebrating, too much time with our fists in the air, too much time talking about black power without having any of it. Alton Maddox has said the civil rights movement was a consumer rights movement. That indeed it was. We fight to consume somebody else's hamburger. <laughs> Make hotels rich. By, we have enough conferences. All the conferences black organizations have each year, we could build at least 10 major hotels at once. And get, we not only, we can employ each other. But all the empty land not doing anything, 
we could have a series of farms scattered all every state raising our own food be much better if we stop eating out the can all the time we know what come out of the ground got a brother putting it in the ground brother taking it out brother putting it on the truck you look how many people you are employing and what do we lose everywhere the concept of nation responsibility. This is what has been taken away from us these 500 years. This is the supreme tragedy on our mind in the world Christopher Columbus did not discover. Programming our mind to convince us that we could not even make a safe defense. You can't make a safety pin, you can't make a locomotive. We have to tabulate how many years we're going to be dependent on other people for basic survival. That bargaining chip sooner or later will be, I will close off your community and let nothing comes in. Then what are you going to do? Not having learned to make a gun, you hadn't even learned how to, how to fix one. All these veterans coming out of the army, with all this skill, have you learned how to marshal that skill? Have you learned how to tap that skill? They could have gone to Africa and built some of the finest modern armies in the world. I have often said that the black man properly equipped, properly inspired, properly led is the greatest human fighting machine the world has ever known. But we always, our skill always going fighting for other people. Now let's go to Africa itself. The Africans educated in Africa with African money scattered all over the world. They want to be everything but Africans. They've turned Africa over to a bunch of thugs. Coup after coup after coup. Who's going to give Africa the stability that it needs? I maintain, and this might be away from the subject now, I maintain that there is no solution for African people except some form of pan-African nationalism. No matter how you cut it, no matter what island you're from, no matter what state you're from, no matter what religion you belong to, we must develop a concept of pan-African nationalism that cuts across all religious, political, social, fraternity, sorority lines and makes us one people facing the world as one people and, prou and proud of it. We must stop apologizing and stop imitating and begin to innovate. For people to be free, they have to produce one sacrificial generation. And that generation must be the role model for other generations to come. Maybe a generation have to wear dungarees so that another generation can wear a tuxedo. We have not considered that. We have to seriously step back and think of what we need to do and how do we liberate ourselves from the plagues the cultural famines, the misconceptions set in motion by the rise of Europe in the Christopher Columbus period of the 15th and the 16th century. How do we be a whole people again? I think we should begin by finding a mirror and liking what we see. If we can't like what we see, then we can't make each other whole again. It can't be just ceremony. We can't decorate the outside of the head forever without putting something inside of the head. There can't be... <laughs> we can't have war between men and women 
because no people can be free if one half of the mind of the people is tied up in conflict. It's going to have to be both of us or none of us. We're going to have to find some unity that stretches across island lines, culture lines, accent lines, and national lines. We're hung up with so many offbeat religions, none of which we created. We're cutting each other to pieces, deserting each other, destroying each other based on ideologies of no consequence to us as a people. I remember, and I'm going to end with this, as a little boy on the farm, I'm churning. You churn until the butter comes to the top. And I'm counting the churns. And I asked my old grandmother, my great grandmother, Grandma, which one of the churns brings up the butter? She says, all of them, my son. Well, which one? There's no one. <laughs> all of them. We have to realize that it is not the effort of any one of us that will lead to freedom, but the collective work of all of us who are sincere that will ultimately end and the freedom and the liberation of our own people and the indoctrination of our children so that they in turn will pick up the responsibility and create an age where you never have to call for freedom again because there'll never be any need to call for it because from this for from that day forward we'll always have it. Thank you. document number two. What is its subtitle so that I may look it up because I was calling the UN. They um, said that it wasn't under um, that particular title. Does it have another subheading so that I might find it? The subheading is slave trading in the Indian Ocean. Thank you. Any other questions? Was the lecture that clear? Spain and the expulsion of the various groups towards African Arabs as part of Jews. And uh, at a later point, you, you mentioned that in, in current history, uh, we would be hard pressed to find a Latin American or Spanish uh, speaking country that was economically sound. Yes, yes. Okay, I would just like to take that to what you touched on regarding South Africa. And I thought I understood you to say the expulsion of, of those who were not for perhaps taking back the land or for a specific doctrine. Yes, yes, that's what I mean. Um, I'd like to know what your comments would be on uh, the possibilities of economic devastation in South Africa. Is that a possibility or, or what could be done to avoid that if in fact um, the expulsion of various groups? Uh, no, that's, what, that's a myth that a whole lot of people are holding out to keep whites there. If whites go to be economic devastation, well, damn it, face some economic devastation, but face freedom along with it. I mean, who, who's running the mine? Who's, who's going down in the mines now? Who's facing the danger now? African people facing it. Then let the African supervise. He's been supervising anyway. Dr. Clark, I agree with you 100%. But, but look, Africa, South Africa has some of the best developed agriculture in all Africa. They can still eat. I mean, I just don't maintain that white people are essential to this world. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 
Let her finish her question if she's not satisfied. Thank you. Um, actually, I was referring to African people being expelled from the country. No, I, I'm not I, necessarily to to the white Africanos who are there. Well, I ain't, I'm not talking about African people being expelled from the country. It's their country. Okay. That's what I'm, I'm not even thinking about Africans being expelled from the country. I'm talking about let the invader be expelled. I thought perhaps you were referring to certain subgroups. Thank you. No, I'm, no, no, no. I'm, uh, eventually, the, the Africans will have to deal with the Arab, too. Go to deal with him militarily. He's a slave trader and a dog and a womanizer <laughs> and a spoiler. No, I'm not talking about the African. It, it's, it's his home. I think the African can settle his difference if white people stayed out of it. <coughs> I think the Zulus and others can sell that difference. They've lived in peace before, and they can again. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Uh, peace, Dr. Clark. I don't know if this, um, this question was uh, asked yet, but I'm interested in knowing how you feel about um, um, uh, Whoopi Goldberg and uh, um, Simon going to uh, South Africa and how the ANC was, well, Mandela was uh, seen um, holding uh, Simon's hand in, in, in support of him going over there and, you know, performing. I'm well, I, I consider ANC equivalent to the NACP. <laughs> and I'm a supporter of PAC myself. And as for Whoopi Goldberg, uh, I have not even seen one of her pictures. And <laughs> she has an attitude that I find personally offensive. Uh, and she's taken her 30 pieces of silver and gone. And she, I don't consider Whoopi Goldberg being a part of our struggle. And, why don't we just go ahead and write some people off and go on our business? Do what we have to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Clark. Thank you. 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 And Dr. Jeffries will be here next week. He uh, expressed uh, great, uh, great uh, satisfaction to have one of those sports enshrined and us to capture it as a shrine in recognition of our Africans and sisters in Paris. That's the first question. What, would you, what do you think of that? And well, I was, I was a part of that initially to have one of the sports uh, uh, enshrined to us. And Dr. Lee was working on it, and I think he's still working on it, but it was stymied by, uh, by a Ghanaian who was on the, being paid off by a European. And I very much know who you're talking about. One of the old Dutch forts. I can't recall the name now, but we were there. Fort Amsterdam. It's up the coast there. And my second question. I've been there. I've been to the fort. I know exactly what you're talking about. The second question is, Mary Cuomo and his cohorts are getting ready to have a big celebration in 1992, Columbus Day. What can we as African people do to, to instill within our children the living lie that has been forged and edged into each and every one of our lives since day one? But tell them the truth and stay away from any form of celebration, and I have advocated that we disrupt the celebrations. And I also advocate that the indigenous American dressed in his uh, traditional uh, uniform, feathers and all, tomahawk and all, and <laughs> scalp some white people in the middle of the parade. <laughs> and the, all of us wear morning cloth during the day Go in all flags in our neighborhood, be at half mass. 
mourning of the dead. If I may interrupt, and this is out of respect to Dr. Clark. If you think that Dr. Clark is just talking for talk's sake, no, I'll share an experience for you. He's modest, he never said these things. I think it was in 1968 in Montreal. He attended a black history conference. And when he found that most of the so-called teachers who were teaching black history in Montreal, he single-handedly turned that conference upside down alone. That same man. So he's not just talking. He does it too. Watch out for the clap. Uh, this question regards uh, the situation in Azali, mm -hmm. particularly at this juncture, because there is a controversy surrounding the tour by Paul Simons, who is a U.S. Um, artist. So, uh, what is happening? The ANC in Qatar and the regime, given you know their reformist posture regarding the so-called negotiations, they have provided um, the security for this talk to go on. And in my view, th that action it gives the international community the view that there is some change going on, whilst there is none. And what is happening now, the UN is trying to frustrate particularly the African group who are opposed to that, you know, visit. Because it, in our view, it violates the, um, the isolation culturally of the regime. So what, what's your view, Dr. Clark, about that thing? Do you think, you know, these artists, they should go inside the country to perform for the Boers? Well, I was not only been against it, but I mean, 15 years ago, I found, I was helped to find a committee that uh, had as its purpose to keeping black artists out of South Africa, and at that time, Sammy Davis agreed not to go. Um, I don't think Arthur Ashe did any good by going. Um, I have not gone to South Africa, and although I've had many paid trips offered to me, I have not gone to South Africa because the political activists in South Africa have told me not to go, and I respect their wishes because it might be misinterpreted. And I've gone to nearly every place in Africa except South Africa. I've gone next door. And, uh, I can almost look over in South Africa, but I haven't gone. I mean, I think symbols mean a whole lot, and and I think appearances mean a whole lot, and I think there's certain things we need to abstain from, and I don't expect anything from Paul Simon, and I don't expect anything from lame brains like Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> then there are certain black entertainers who are stone opportunists and who will go for the fee. Yeah. So these people are not a part of our freedom struggle. They, they're, they're sellouts. And they're looking after themselves. They sell their mother's bath water if the price is right. <laughs> but I, I think there should be some unity within the African world on our behavior and relationship to the African freedom struggle. And I think we have to make some stands. I think there should be not just South Africa. I think the black churchmen in America should make a stand by the fact that Ghana has been turned into a nation of Jesus freaks and Nigeria is a nation of thieves. And that the land question in Zimbabwe was never settled, and that stagnant in Zimbabwe, it could have become the great another example nation to replace the uh, Ghana that was taken out of continue. I think the African would have to accept some responsibility for a lot of things that has happened in Africa. That That's so true. 
then we over here have to accept more responsibility, but there are certain responsibilities we cannot shoulder because we're not close to the, uh, to the apparatus of it. There'll be enough responsibility for both of us. But I have no problem with the South African situation as much as I've been involved in it for so long and I wrote a, set, a series of protest ar articles on the South African resistance movement. I wrote it in the early 40s. And even when I went to Africa, a lot of the articles have been reprinted in different parts of Africa. I wrote for old drum magazine in, in South Africa. I mean, I, I'm no stranger to this whole Africa cause. A lot of people just jumping on the bandwagon. I was there two generations ago. Please come to you, Dr. Clark. My question is about nationalities of man and woman. Do you believe that all nationalities and species of man and Roman are human beings. And do you think that we can all come together as human beings on that one, uh, on one uh, plane as being human beings? My answer is yes. But if you're on a non-racial kick, my answer is no. Race is an artificial creation. And I've heard it said by an African, I relate to everybody who breathes oxygen. That's cute, you know. I don't relate just to blacks. I relate to everybody who breathes oxygen. I mean, I think groups of people based on culture, based on environment, based on common interests need to come together. And I think you can be racial without being racist. I do not separate man and woman based on nationality. I think, and I don't think woman's nationality is any different from a male um, nationality. I have no problem along those lines. I have no problem of conceding the fact that some women in the world are more brilliant than I am. I, if they're in leadership, I would have no problem in following them. I have no problem if some women can see the fact that I've got some, some talent they don't have and because I've got some talent they have, there are certain cases they need to follow me. Once it's balanced off, I'll follow those who've got the best answer at the time, not based on who's, who's a female, who's a male, but who's got the best answer for the situation at the time the situation arises. Yeah. The situation in Africa has become very pathetic. It's a fact that Nigeria, for example, is a land of taking leadership. It's a fact that many other African nations is a land of contributions. Just as in your own days, when there was this meeting of the minds between the between Africans all over the world that produced or that led to the so called flag independence. Don't you think for the twenty first century? There should be another movement by Africans all over the world to take over the leadership in most African nations, not just advisory capacity, but taking it over. It's a fact that we've had several coups in most African nations, and the contribution in those coups is that it's been financed from outside in order to put their own African studies in power. Don't you think it's about time that we Africans too 
who understand the dynamics of pan-African nationalism should also have a movement to take over the reins of power in Africa, not just the advisory. I mean, take it over for the 21st century and tell them to get seated or we show them the graves, as you said, because we cannot show them no shipyards, no red ship in the field. What do you advise, sir? I have advocated this all along. In many times, first-rate Africans are in retreat from Africans while third-rate Africans are taken over. These third-rate Africans are stooges to the old colonial power recolonizing Africa. It is so clear that I don't know why anybody should be confused about it. Some Africans at the risk of their life are going to have to go home and do it. And some Africans are going to have to concede the fact that there's some black Americans that have something to offer for African redemption, for Africa's freedom. And if he fails to offer it and he fails to deliver it, then let him go. But at least give some of them some chances to offer it. There are too many third-rate, second-rate white people working in Africa who are not delivering anything to Africa, being chauffeured around by cars called experts, being given big salaries. There are black Americans who will work for half of that and, and drive their own car. That black, I advocate that black doctors should that one year of their residence should be spent in an African hospital. <laughs> Same thing is true of nurses. Same thing is true of engineers. Some of them will stay. Let's let them go to Africa and work around, look around, see all those lush and well upholstered ladies. Some of them will stay there forever. <laughs> I mean, I have a chance of a pan-African union of good, I mean, most interracial marriages end up producing a whole lot of confused people who don't know who they are. And yes, anyway, and <coughs> we got to love each other enough to realize that I got some preferences, you know. I mean, uh, I've had two encounters. They hadn't been as good as I wanted them to be, but I still prefer the sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reasonable. Do you think the discussion about some coming world conflict taking place in Korea, and if you think it's reasonable, what are the implications of the remilitarization? Re of this country and our involvement. What do you think that involvement would be and how do you think that would affect people of color here and in Africa? And this, in oh, this is already being done. It's already being done because in the first place, we need jobs more than other people. We're going into the military many times because it's better than any other job we can find. The white boys got more choices. And remilitarization of the United States, uh, it's obvious that we are going to be the ones. Is that the same? But the United States is now facing a surplus. And they, they're getting ready to put people out of the army because of the, the, of the expense. They've got excess generals now. Potentially perhaps perceived as a threat because of their military information. That's a good question. Low skills or what got skills? Low, Low skills? Low skills in terms of being able to fit into Eurocentric plans for jobs, systems analyst positions, other kinds of technical positions, not having exposure to those and having exposure to the military. What do you think a perceived plan will be, or is there one? to place those people? Do you think they will be placed or rooted into another area? I think they'll be rooted into another area 
But some of them, some people from the Persian Gulf, they kind of already own this. Yes, that's right. They're not all black. Do you think that um, to discuss war in Asia is reasonable or just basically a ploy to divert our attention away from what's happening here? I don't know if you're going to have war in Asia, I don't know who you're going to have it against. And for what? It seems that, that people are manufacturing disagreements between uh, certain groups, the Koreans, the Malaysians, the Japanese, that kind of thing. Do you think that will even take flight or is it a lot of talk? I think it's a possibility, but I don't see the people as buying it. I think that for the West to hold on, it has to do something to slow down this new industrialization coming from Asia. And if Africa ever industrialized, you, you, the West can forget it. But if, but Africa would industri if Africa industrialized with Western, t with Western in charge of it, you can use his technology, but you can't use his. Um, no, no. <coughs> what Africa need to do now, if Africa buys Japanese cars, Africa need to assemble the cars and eventually start making the cars. So it makes sense. I mean, to never become prisoner to someone else's technology. No matter what you got, learn how to manage it to the extent that if a person withdraw their relationship with you, you know how to handle it. Or know another place you can get it. Don't ever become a prisoner to anybody's technology. You didn't finish your question. No, I finished. Thank you very much, Dr. Clark. I'll talk to you again. All right. Dr. Clark, what country or countries in Africa would you recommend for a first visit for a group of young people between the ages of 12 and 16? Well, I would, I'm in favor of going in spite of the Jesus freak atmosphere. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the place I've stayed mostly in in Africa, of all the places I've stayed and loved the most, I found the people of Ghana was the, had the, the nicest uh, personality of any African people I've stayed with for any length of time. Good evening, Dr. Clark. We love you and appreciate you. Thank you. My question is, I, as I hear these lectures and read and notice things in my day to day, I am seeing more and more that the European Jews were on the scene at too many places where African people were in destructive positions. Am I seeing this correctly? Can you clarify some of this for me? And if this is correct, what can we as Af African people do and how should we be able to identify this more? Well, if you read Ken Weissman's thought about the trial and error, when they established Israel, the promise was that they would be a bastion the whole back to eastern hordes and protect the trade lines of the Indian Ocean. The Jewish people have never in actuality had a homeland other than Europe. And any homeland claimed outside of Europe is a bogus lie, including the biblical homeland. The European Jew is a convert. Because he's a kind of wandering gypsy, he has to move from country to country selling his talent. A set of circumstances in history has unfortunately reduced the Jew to an international prostitute. That's true. So you don't know who he's going to be loyal to next, because don't know who, don't know who is 
his next buyer. But they control, in the main education, they control the science of the minds because they have control over psycho psychology and psychiatry. They have control over education. They have extensive control over large areas of communication. Yes. They have control over images through Hollywood. When you control what people say, think, what people see, you control a great deal of what they think. Absolutely. So long as a white God hangs in your church your as the father, as your spiritual father, your physical father in your home has less authority. Because both of those, there's a conflict between those two fathers. And that's something we have to deal with. And, but he plays the role his master assigned to him. And he ingratiates himself with the Gentile by controlling us. And he threw out a few pennies here and there mm -hmm. to get a reputation as a philanthropist. Yes. And we accept that, and yes. not knowing that. From the beginning, he controlled the NACP and still does. Yeah. Sure. Behind the scene, Urban League. And, <laughs> and I'll be entering to higher education to some extent through the Negro College Fund, and that used to be the General Educational Fund, originally controlled by the Rockefellers. who have some Jewish in their background. Mm -hmm. We are a people somewhat naive and tragically innocent because we wouldn't do certain things. We assume other people wouldn't do certain things. Mm -hmm. And we are the victims of not accepting the fact that we have very few friends in this world, if yeah. any. And if we're looking for a friend, we have to find a mirror. <laughs> Don't find one there, maybe you haven't got one. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I want to say good evening, Dr. Clark, sisters and brothers. Uh, in view of all the things that I've heard here this evening, the short time I've been here, I'm listening to all the stimuli that we're talking about, the lectures and the things that come out of them. What I'd like to know is that in the future, in the near future, that we're going to sit down with scholars like you and Dr. Ben and many others, Dr. Jeffries, and develop some kind of plan. I just, I just see things out of focus. I don't see us coming together and condensing anything. You know, we're talking about curriculum inclusion. We're talking about a number of other things, like we did here tonight. When are we going to develop a plan of action so we can move forward as a people? Do you think we can do that now, in the near future, or do we have to? continue to wait until we think more people have raised their conscious level in order to think that way. I'd like to know There have been many plans and unfortunately most people who call for plans don't read them when we get them out there. The Black Caucus put out a plan oh 12, 14 years ago family plan. Basically good. She can't have the open black Africa, the politics of a federated state put out a plan for preserving the minerals of Africa. Most people never read it. Chancellor Williams and the destruction of black civilization laid out a plan. He had laid out a similar plan in a book called The Rebirth of African Civilization. Who read it? Many people read all parts of the book and came to the plan and skipped out all over it. The question is not a plan, but who, at what point are we going to take the plan serious? Thank you, sir. Now, uh, as for curricula, 
I did a book of lectures with Dr. Ben in London, and at the back of the book, it was included, our lectures included a book called Our Story. But they included the works of Karinga in the book as the Egyptologist, and, and, and included Dr. Ben's work and my work as though we were the junior, he was the senior. So instead of fighting about it, we just took Ben's work and my book out and created a separate book called New Dimensions in African History. And the back of that book, you've got the most extensive curriculum, an extensive bibliography. A lot of people read the book, didn't even get, didn't read that part of it. So the question, when is the people going to read? I mean, I, I taught it with Professor Jeffries, and, and I did a two-part uh, run curriculum in Africa, my Africa History One, just the basic outline for Africa History One was 72 pages. I mean, there have been plans out there, been basic, you don't have to write, you don't have to do another curriculum. There's so many of them out there already, already done. Well, what do you suggest that we do at this point? arrive at what we're trying to achieve as a people? How do we get, uh, get the plan to the local level and to our churches and our community? How, how do we do I would that? tell every, every teacher in the black community, in the predominantly black community, if you cannot teach self-reliance, if you cannot teach, uh, I'll give you 18 months to learn enough about history uh, 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 to stimulate these black students. If you can't do it, look for a job elsewhere. Ain't no reprieve. Don't be talking to me after that. I mean, I, they get hard on it. I mean, I, I'm tired of excuses. A lot of black teachers, that's the biggest cop out of some of the white teachers. They will not do it. They'll tell you that the union not going to make them do it, so they ain't going to do it. Union or no union. I bring enough pressure through the parents and through the community to get you out of there, no matter what the union says. We got to get hard. Sometimes things have to be different. One more. Uh, one more. Can, can you take it? Well, somebody had to feel it. I'm taking the front. I can't see the hands in any case. Uh, okay. Um, all right, go ahead, brother. Uh, good evening, Dr. Carter. <coughs> I have a very uh, specific question. I'd like to know, and would you tell us all, what do you think of the substance abuse issue, drugs in the African <coughs> community, specifically targeted to our adolescents? I think, think I think I think it's it's not only done deliberately, but I think it was started during World War II, and a deal was made with the mafia. And that it's a form of mind con and behavior control. And it was done with the approval of the government. Yes. And that if the government wanted to stop it, they could stop it. Sure, they could. That if we wanted to put, it, put our minds to it, we could stop it too. Sure. Well, said, just stop doing it. That's all. I mean, block, block by block. I, Block by block, I think we could break every, every crack house in the black community. And close them down. Sisters and brothers, remember the tapes will be available at the back before you leave. We appreciate your presence and your continued support. Thank you. See you next week. Yeah. I would like uh, me to autograph three books for me, sir. All right. Uh, my name is Tan.